On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, can you use seawater to fight the fires in Los Angeles? I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So a lot of questions regarding this use. Can salt water be used to extinguish the fires that are currently ravaging around Los Angeles? This channel is about global shipping. However, my background is as a former merchant mariner, but I've also been a 25-year firefighter, both paid and volunteer, currently a captain on my volunteer fire department. And I've fought fires both on ships and ashore. And so I know a little something about using seawater and salt water when it comes to fighting fires. So there's a lot of issues, rumors, myths going on about it. The number of stories that are out there in the press regarding this is a lot. However, what I want to do is tackle some of the biggest issues that have been identified. And in particularly, there's four of them. Number one, does salt water corrode fire equipment and therefore should not be used? Number two, salt water doesn't provide as much cooling as fresh water, therefore it's not as efficient. Three, using salt water will harm plant life and more importantly, create a barren landscape afterwards. And four, is it difficult to draw from the ocean? We're going to address all of those coming up here. First, let's talk about the underlying situation, which is the shortage of water in fighting this fire. Everybody has heard the stories about hydrants and water supplies going dry in the fight for this. So a couple of things to be aware of. Number one, because of the large number of homes that are involved in this fire, most people, when they evacuate their homes, fail to do two very important things. Number one, cut the gas off to their homes. And second, turn off the water. Now, when houses burn down to the ground, which is what's happening here, if you have failed to turn off the water, even the individual valves in your home, I'm talking about the valves to your sinks, to your toilets, to the washing machine, to the dishwasher, what happens is when your house burns down to the ground, those pipes are wide open and it places a drain on the water supply. This is why when you go to home fires that have burnt down, you'll see water spraying everywhere. You either need to individually shut those off in the house or better yet, turn it off at the master coming into your house. In North Carolina, we have that by the driveway or the sidewalk or the roadside, there is a cutoff so that you can do it. I would think in Los Angeles, in an area that's very prone to wildfires like this, there should be an automatic shutoff of some kind that does this. However, what this does is it drains down the water supply. So when you start burning entire areas and neighborhoods, that water is flowing. Second, Water systems are designed to use gravity as much as possible. You can't usually physically pump water, especially uphill, and supply everyone. So this is why you have large water towers that are in areas. Water towers use height and gravity and the weight of the water to provide pressure in the system. And water towers are almost constantly being refilled. Uh, water companies can monitor those tanks. They can determine how much water needs to go in, usually during really off-peak water hours at night and when water consumption isn't high, the tanks are being filled back up. The problem is that when there is a heavy demand on water, you usually cannot match the output versus the input. And so what happens is this fire burned, it started putting a heavy drain on the tanks and the tanks started getting lower and lower. As water tanks get lower and lower, you start losing pressure because there's not enough weight on the water to push it through the system. And in the case of the wildfires in California, what you had was the tanks started going dry. You had a reservoir that was short of water or no water whatsoever. And so therefore you don't have it. This is why in part of infrastructure for communities, you need more water towers. Water towers are not sexy. No one likes to talk about them, but you need them. You also at times need independent water tanks to provide a separate system. So the loss of water for this fire is not new. I mean, we've seen this happen before and most safety regulations are written in blood. Go back to 1906 and the San Francisco earthquake. Most of the city of San Francisco was not destroyed by the earthquake. It was destroyed by a subsequent fire that ravaged the city. Gas lines fractured, multiple fires were ignited. And one of the things that they found out in San Francisco was their water source was insufficient. If you go to San Francisco today, you'll see two types of fire hydrants. What are known as laurel fire hydrants, these are skinny fire hydrants. Most fire hydrants in all cities are hooked into the same water system that goes into your houses. So those water pipes that go into areas 
all have the same water source. And this is being pumped from towers and from municipal systems throughout the area. So when you look at a fire hydrant in front of your home, that water comes out of there is the same one that's in your house. The problem, of course, is that as the system loses pressure, loses water, you can't sustain it. So what they did in San Francisco was built a second system, a loop system that's known as the as as the, the Hardy system. These are bigger, fatter, rounder uh, fire hydrants. They are hooked up on a separate pipeline system to a series of reservoirs high up on the hill. And then as a backup, should those reservoirs fail or drain or something happen, they can be hooked up to pumping systems that pump salt water in from the ocean. And so San Francisco has a redundancy in this. The problem why most cities don't do this is very simple money. It costs a lot of money. Usually to build systems, developers, home builders want to build the smallest water pipe hose system into your subdivision, into your area that they can get away with. And that robs water. It's a big problem. Plus, you don't have water retaining, water retention systems that allow you to prevent this fire from spreading. All right, that's the background why there isn't water. Let's talk about how you use salt water here. So back in 2021, the Los Angeles County Fire Department, along with Long Beach Fire Department, conducted a series of training exercises down in the port of Long Beach. They used some U.S. government vessels to train in how to fight fires on board ships. And to do that, they brought several assets in, including the big fireboats that both the Port of Long Beach and the Port of Los Angeles have. Now, these fireboats are absolutely essential in fighting fires because not only do they do the traditional spraying water, which we've always seen before, but they have manifolds, which means that those boats can pump water ashore through what's called large diameter hose. So the two boats down in the port of LA and the port of Long Beach, 41,000 gallons per minute uh, and 31,000 gallons per minute. Give you an idea, a forestry hose sprays roughly about 13 to 60 gallons per minute out of it. A firefighting hose used for house extinguishment can spray anywhere from 125 to 250 gallons per minute. So these boats can pump enormous amounts of water and they have a system of manifolds located around the ship so that you can hook up what's called large diameter hose and you can start flowing water. Now you can also get portable units that can be used to pump water ashore. So in the case of the fires taking place in the Palisades, for example, you could have the Los Angeles fireboat, you could have the Long Beach fireboat right off the coast and through a system of a float or underwater hoses which the military use a lot. As a matter of fact, they have some of this right over at Port Wainimi, which is just that right by where this is taking place. You can be pumping large quantities of water ashore. And if you use fire trucks and large diameter hose, this is big five or six inch portable hose, you can actually lay into the interior here and provide water refilling points. This is known as relay pumping. And you don't even need the fireboats because you can get portable pumps on trailers that can be brought up into the surf or along a dock or pier into the water, suck in the salt water and use it. Has strainers on board. This would give you a lot of water. And there are fire departments that I know that train on laying over a mile of long, uh, large diameter hose. Most trucks are required to have roughly about 800 to 1,000 feet, about a fifth of a mile of that hose, fifth to a sixth of a mile on board each truck. And so you can preposition this equipment so that you can lay in hose from the beach and set up fill points so that fire trucks can shuttle water to the fire. So that addresses number four there. Number one, corrodes fire equipment. So both the Fire Department of New York, representatives from the Fire Department of New York and from Oregon have come out and said that is not exactly true. If you read some of the statements that are out there, you would think that if salt water touches your truck, it is going to crumble into a pile of rust. This article is out on X. Why firefighters fear salt water. Salt water is a harsh mistress laden with salt and minerals. It is an arch nemesis to metals, pumps, and pipes. The corrosive properties of salt can ravage firefighting equipment faster than a California wildfire devours a drought-stricken hillside. Hoses, pumps, and engines subjected to repeated salt water exposure deteriorate rapidly, leading to costly replacements and potential failures in critical moments. All right, let's talk about what's entirely wrong with that statement. Number one, 
As part of a rural fire department, we will use water from ponds, from water sources everywhere. We will suck up the most crap you've ever seen. I mean, I have pulled sand buckets of sand out of our pump after we back flushed it. So is it good for the pump? No, it's not good for the pump, but you're supposed to be fighting fires. Number And number two, there is no way that this is going to deteriorate your pump faster than a wildfire going up a hill, okay? You're talking about long protracted issues with the pump. Also, when you use salt water and equipment, what you do afterwards when you're done is you flush it. You flush it with fresh water. You, you back flush a truck, get all the sediment, get all the material out of it, and you get rid of it. Understand, what you're talking about here is the pump is not going to corrode and fall out of the truck. That's not going to happen because if that was the case, every fire truck up in New England and the Midwest, up north, driving on roads coated with salt, that salt encrusts the outer side of the pump because the pump is located in, usually in the middle of the fire truck and all that stuff gets up into the compartment there and covers everything. That's not what's going to happen. What you may happen is the impeller, which throws the water in the interior, may start getting some pitting on it. You may start seeing a deterioration of the wear rings. You may start seeing the packing, you may start to see it leaking more, but that can be fixed during a normal pump maintenance period. This is not catastrophic. You can use salt water. It is not going to do it. The hoses, you're not going to have an issue with hoses. You may see some issue with the gaskets, but can be easily replaced. The valves, the valves are polyurethane valves. I mean, you may get some grit and grime in there that causes some leaking, but the valves are going to work. The tanks are not metal. You use poly tanks. So it's plastic tanks. So the idea that this is going to corrode the fire equipment, over the long protracted life of the truck, you may see a slight reduction in the life of the truck, but if you do proper maintenance on it and if you do wear on it, you can flow salt water through your equipment and it won't harm. The other issue that they have here does not provide as much cooling. Okay. I am sure that there is a scientist out there who's got the chemical formula here to determine the heat absorption of a gallon of salt water versus a gallon of fresh water. But I can tell you this much, a gallon of salt water absorbs more heat than nothing. If you're sitting there watching something burn and don't throw anything on it, a gallon of salt water works really good because I can tell you I put fires out with salt water and guess what? They go out. Now, do you need maybe X percent more of fresh water to get the same result? I don't know. But I can tell you right now, if you don't have salt, you don't have water, you'll take salt water. Salt water is one of the key. The final issue here harms plant life and and makes the, the, the soil barren. Okay, I'm in North Carolina. We have periodic flooding along our coast. I can tell you for a fact that we have seen entire areas inundated with flood water. I mean, soaked for days, if not weeks, with salt water. That water recedes and everything grows back. Is there damage? Of course, of course there's damage. There is going to be damage. Is it a barren wasteland afterwards? No, and I've been to Southern California. I've sat there and felt that ocean breeze spraying in for half the year. You know that ocean breeze is laden with salt water, right? It's coming in, you can taste it. It's on your mouth, it's in your lips. You can feel it everywhere, it coats your cars. That salt water is getting onto the vegetation. It's covering everything. It is not gonna become a barren hellscape. And as a historian, let me dissolve this other issue. There is no evidence that the Romans salted the Carthaginian fields. Everyone loves to use this analogy. They love to use this. The first evidence we ever have of that comes from the 19th century and early 20th century from records. And most salting of the ground does short-term damage. What salt does is what salt does. It sucks moisture out of the ground. It prevents really moisture from being held into the ground. And if I'm not mistaken, right now you're in the middle of a drought, so the ground's probably pretty dry in Southern California right now. And also, let's not forget, you're using salt water right now. You have these Canadian aircraft that are basically landing on the Pacific Ocean, pulling in 1,500 gallons of salt water and dumping them on the fire. Not to mention the fact that most water that's used in fire extinguishment is going to evaporate. It's going to basically disperse over time. And you have to compare the damage you're going to get from salt water, which you are going to get some damage, versus the damage you get from allowing this wildfire to run unchecked. If you want to talk about damage, the 
residue from a burning house and a burning car is worse for the soil than anything else. The amount of chemical and contaminants in the soil are going to be the problem. It is not going to be salt water in the problem. The salt will eventually disperse through rain, through periodic, just, you know, the soil doing what the soil does. Uh, that's part of it. You're not dumping the entire Pacific Ocean on Southern California. You're talking about using it in terms of fire suppression and hopefully stopping this fire. But the last point I want to note is this, is how difficult these firefighters have in fighting this fire. Many of you have probably seen uh, this video or something like it. The winds that they're dealing with out there, the Santa Ana winds are just unbelievable. It is nearly impossible to extinguish this. As you see those embers fly off and because this ground is so dry, it is nearly impossible to put down. When you have a wildfire in Southern California, you have to hit it fast with massive amounts of resources, material, manpower, equipment, you name it. You have got to pile on it because what happens here is this fire acts more like lava from a volcano. It will just keep moving in the path. And if you get in front of it, you're going to get wiped out. The most you can do is minimize its spread laterally on the sides and then come in behind it through the black and hit it hard. Even if you establish fire breaks in front of this, it's going to jump it. It's going to jump it all the time. And so when you have high winds in this area, you have to be on a completely defensive area. It is nearly impossible to be offensive about it. One last thing too, I want to note is because this is such a fast moving fire, this is the reason why you see trees not burnt down because this fire moves so so quickly. What you're seeing burn on those trees right there are the dried out husks. You will not see the leaves burn. There's, there's some crazy conspiracy theorists out there asking questions is why the houses burn, but the trees are still standing. When it moves fast, and let me be clear, I've been on a fire where I watched a 1,500 square foot house burned to the ground in 15 minutes. By the time we got called, dispatched, arrived on scene, a 1,500 foot house because the owner had left the front and back door open and there was high winds, it was like a fire tornado ripping through that house. And all we could do was get defensive and protect the adjoining houses. Uh, we had no situation where we can actually put the fire out at that moment. And we were lucky. We had water, we had equipment, we had plenty of trucks. We could surround that one house. If that one house had been allowed to get out of control and jump from house to house, could have lost the entire neighborhood. And we've seen that happen many times. This is a hellacious, hellacious event. To use salt water is not going to be a negative. Believe me, you use whatever water resources you have. It's going to be difficult to use right now because you have to have proper planning, coordination. You have to have uh, uh, guidelines in place in how to use it. But when you don't have water available, you can actually, through a series of relays, actually pump water up hillsides. You can get water to where you need it. And more importantly, that will allow trucks to refill tenders, fire trucks. You can fill up helicopters. You can dump them. Yes, you're going to have a big maintenance afterwards, making sure the trucks are okay. But it's not going to be the pump falling out of the engine. That's just a ridiculous statement. I hope you found this episode a little bit informative and educational. Looking forward to the comments down below. Uh, feel free to uh, chime in all you want. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, hit the button and subscribe to the channel. But more importantly, if you want to help people, go over, find local charities, local groups that are supporting people in Southern California. I appreciate all the support I get, but what the people who need help right now are all those people being displaced by the fires in Southern California. Until our next episode, this is Sal, signing off.